So this is going to be part two of my video. And we're just going to go to us more specifically to uh, the left hand understanding, like, why is there so much confusion in these church systems today when it comes to the true understanding of the, the scriptures? And that's because it's what's in reference to what Paul mentions, the uh, mystery of iniquity, meaning the, the mystery of lawlessness. So in this time period, they're trying to confuse people to the true understanding of the scriptures so that they can uh, basically come against the most high without even truly understanding that. But let's start reading. Babylon, mystery religion and Roman Catholicism. All roads lead to Babylon. There are only two religions, the truth of the almighty as expressed in his word, the Bible and every other belief. These two religions cannot be mixed without disastrous results. Babylon is a source of false religion as it says in Revelation 17, 1 through 6. When John wrote the Revelation, Babylon as a city had already been destroyed and left in ruins as Old Testament prophets had foretold in Isaiah 13, 19 through 22 and Jeremiah 51 and 52. Though the city of Babylon was destroyed, its religious concepts and customs had spread around the world. Today, myriads of false religions have their origin in ancient Babylon. And it's not just myriads of false religions. All religions have their origin in ancient Babylon which really comes from uh, ancient uh, Kemen. So how, how it works, essentially, it's um, ancient Kemen or ancient Egypt was the beginning of those religions. And then, of course, you had ancient Babylon. But uh, most of where these are religions get their understanding is from ancient Rome, which is really an amalgamation of the teachings of Babylon, Kemen, and also the Etruscans. But Ralph Rudolph, in his book, Babylon, Mystery Religion, clearly traces the practices and teachings of ancient Babylon and their modern counterparts in the Roman Catholic Church and her Protestant daughters. Babylonian ideas are by no means isolated to professing Christianity. Since nominal Christianity is so permeated with false doctrines from Babylon, we should carefully study this problem so as to avoid Babylonianism. Today, there's almost an irresistible tide within Christianity to turn aside to ideas of Babylon and Catholicism. All too many believers are taking one of the many roads to Roman Babylon. And that's because <laughs> those people aren't believers. And the Christian church was never about worshiping the most high in truth and sincerity. Because when you have a, a true understanding of the Bible, you understand that the most high isn't dealing with any of these churches. He's dealing with a, a nation of people or, excuse me, a remnant of a nation of people that are uh, basically coming to the truth. Let's continue, though. Nimrod and Samaramis. Legends are difficult to prove. They are almost impossible to disprove. Nimrod, the mighty hunter before, meaning against the Lord, was the first to organize cities into a kingdom under human rule. This much we know from the Bible. And again, in the scriptures, it doesn't really de detail Nimrod that much. But Nimrod, if you've done any research, he was essentially the beginning of um, the apostasy against the Most High. I'm sure a lot of you script brothers who read the scriptures, the quote unquote Tower of Babel, how they're, quote unquote, building a tower to ascend into heaven. Well, uh, mainly they were building that tower. That tower was a symbol of idolatry. For those of you brothers who've uh, never looked up the term, look up a uh, ziggurat. That, that's what that Tower of Bible was. It was a, basically a large uh, monument. And on the top of the monument would have been uh, some type of idol to worship a false god. But but that that's what that uh, Tower of Bible was about. And again, the main reason they did this was to come against the Most High. And then I was started from uh, the line of Ham. Ham, son was Cush, and then Cush had Nimrod. But continuing on, the name Nimrod comes from the word Murad, meaning he rebelled. Legend has it that Nimrod married his own mother, Semiramis. After Nimrod died, Semiramis claimed Nimrod was the sun god. He later had a child to Muz, who she claimed was Nimrod reborn, supernaturally conceived, the promised seed, the savior. Now, this is where you get the concept of reincarnation from. And also this is where you get the concept in the Christian church about the quote unquote Virgin Mary giving birth to the Savior or the seed. It has to do with this uh, ancient uh, pagan Babylonian belief, because those of you who have truly read the scriptures, we understand that Christ had a father being Joseph because uh, it was to fulfill biblical prophecy. He had to come from the seed of David, from the line of David to fulfill the promise that the Most High made to David. And also, <laughs> for him to be tempted and tried like every other man and to die like every other man and to be humble and to come in the form of the man, he had to have a father like everybody else. If he was, quote unquote, immaculate, 
that defeats the purpose of him coming down in the form of a man and being humbled. Because at the end of the day, he wouldn't have been humbled. He wouldn't have been like every other man. He would have been supernatural. But continue on. Semiramis developed a religion of mother and child worship. Symbols were used to develop a mystery of religion. Since Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, Baal, and for those of you brothers who don't know who Baal is, that's uh, one of the gods of the Canaanites in the scriptures. He was a, um, a god of fire, but also a storm god as well. So um, that's why um, if you've ever done any research on like um, the Greek religion, quote unquote Zeus, Zeus is, is Baal. Because Zeus is also a storm god, a sky god. Baal wasn't just a god of fire. He was a god of the sky as well. But continuing on, fire was considered his earthly representation. In other forms, Nimrod was symbolized by sun images, fish, and for the fish, that'd be the god Dagon, the fish god, trees, pillars, and animals. To lose, son of the sun god, was represented by the golden calf. And so it was that mankind followed this religion and worshipped the creature, the creation, excuse me, rather than the creator. And now this golden calf, I'm sure you brothers have uh, read in the story of Exodus how the Israelites worship the golden calf. That was known as the Apis pole. And again, that's just a representation of uh, Tammuz, the sun god, because uh, in the ancient world, the reason why the uh, quote unquote, the bull was in reference of the sun god is because in the ancient world, horns were an image of the sun as well, or power. That's why, for example, um, for those of you who read the scriptures, when it mentions how um, uh, Moses, after seeing uh, the most high, was enlightened or his face glowed. When you look it up in, in the Hebrew, it, else, it, it says he has horns. Or, uh, ex for example, in the book of Habakkuk, when it, is, it talks about Christ's return, and it says there were horns coming from his hands. Those represent beams of light. So, again, the image, the symbol of the horn and the image of light or enlightenment or the sun are all synony synonymous. Uh, continuing on, whether or not the Nimrod, Samaramis, Tammuz legends are completely historical or not is immaterial. The result of these legends is that mankind in general has followed various of one kind or, or another of the religion of Babylon to this day. Rome, the greatest and longest lived human ruling empire, assimilated religions from many conquered territories. All these religions had commonalities, for they all came from Babylon. These practices infiltrated and overcame the professing Christian church, which later came to be dominated by Rome itself. And of course, that mainly happened during the 4th century AD, uh, during the reign of Constantine. Uh, during the Nicene Council. That's when uh, he was essentially able to gather many of the church fathers at that time and uh, establish the uh, the Roman Catholic Church, which prior to that was just the Church of Rome, which was completely pagan. Continuing on, mother and child worship, quote unquote, Mary worship. Now, before I read, you see these images? The mother holding the child. And notice the disc around their head, the, the halo, the nimbus, which is the sun disc. By the way, that's why if you ever seen images in Christianity with angels having that little disc around their head, or sometimes you'll see Christ or Mary or the Most High. If they don't have a halo, they have kind of like a, a round disc or like basically an illuminating sun around their head. That's in a reference to the quote unquote sun god Baal or Zeus or uh, any of these pagan entities. It has nothing to do with the scriptures. Because, again, the sun represents enlightenment. So these are illuminated fi figures. They are basically Masonic figures. Continuing on, pictures are worth a thousand words. If you doubt the common origin of many pagan practices, pictures showing the striking similarity should convince you. Many pagan religions have mother and child worship, whether Devaki and Krishna, that's India, Isis and Horus, Venus or Fortuna and Jupiter, etc. Each nation gave different names to essentially the same a god or goddesses, a mother goddess or queen of heaven was said to have given a miraculous birth to a son. Ancient Israel sometimes followed this false religion. Judges 2 and 3, 10 and 6, 1 Samuel 7, 3 and 4, etc., etc., with disastrous results. In Ephesus, Samaramis was worshipped as the great mother Diana, the many breast goddess. This form of mother child worship was followed throughout all Asia and the world in Acts 19 and 27. And what I do remember about that uh, portion in Acts is that the people in Ephesus worshipped the god Diana so much that uh, when the apostle Paul was trying to bring uh, certain people into the truth, 
I believe they 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 sh- they uh, cried or chanted, you know, glory be to our Diana of Ephesus, glory be to our Diana of Ephesus. And I'm trying to remember how many hours it might have been. It might have been like a day, six or seven hours. But I just remember it was in an orderly long period of time. Y- y'all brothers can look it up in the scriptures. Mary worship had no place in the early Christian church. Even the Catholic Encyclopedia, Virgin Mary, page 49 through 46, 459 through 460, admits that in the first centuries A.D., there was no traces of worship of Mary. By the fourth century, the time of Emperor Constantine, worshiping Mary as a pagan goddess, offering cakes at her shrine began to to come into the professing church. And again, that uh that worship it all starts with Constantine you, during the Council of Nicaea I believe um it was between 410 to 420 AD I believe it was 412 AD exactly but y'all brothers y'all can look it up but continuing on in AD 431 the Council of Ephesus made Mary worship official by mixing beliefs already being practiced Diana of Ephesus worship as a goddess with nominal Christianity. So-called church fathers reason that they could, could gain more converts. It is the same old story. Apostates believe that lowering God's standards result in a better form of religion, more acceptable and popular than masses. Now, that's true to a certain degree. But the real reason why these changes were made is because it's basically a way to get the people to worship the pagan gods of old in secret. Because a lot of these quote-unquote church fathers behind the scenes were worshiping these false gods. And they were they, they were trying to find a way to get the people to worship the false gods as well. And especially during that time period, due to Christianity and its spread, people were very zealous about, you know, Christ. And they wanted to essentially destroy a lot of these false uh, religions and doctrines. So many of these, quote unquote, occultics had to go into hiding. And the only way where they could hide and still, you know, profess and practice their religion is was in secret. That's the main reason of the apostasy. Continuing on, though, the Bible is clear that there is only one mediator to be between the Most High and man, the man Christ. First Timothy 2 and 5. Yet Roman Catholicism teaches that Mary is also a mediator. Catholics offer prayers to Mary, burn candles to Mary, and have statues of Mary which come directly from their pagan counterparts. Isis, the Egyptian goddess, was known as the mother of God, just as Mary is titled by the Catholics because of Mary is uh, essentially uh, Isis. She is just a hint to the average person because they're not aware of the mysteries. Weigel in the paganism in our Christianity, page 199 says, when Christianity triumphed, these paintings and figures became those of the Madonna and child without any breaking in continuity. No archaeologist, in fact, can now tell whether some of these objects represent the one or the other <laughs> because they represent the, the, the same thing, the quote unquote Mary with the child, it always represented the the pagan gods of old. They just called it by a different name to confuse the people. In pagan religion, the mother was worshipped as much or more than her son. Noted Roman Catholic writer Alphonsus Liguori stressed that prayers addressed to Mary are much more effectual than to Christ. Mary is deified as the queen of heaven, born without sin, the Immaculate Conception. Again, that's that's not scriptural. The mother of, of the Most High, exactly as pagan worshippers defi- deified Isis, Venus, Ashtoreth, Diana, Minerva, etc. Christ did not teach that Mary was superior to other human beings. When someone mentioned his mother and brethren, Christ asked, who is my mother and who are my brethren? Then stretching forth his hand toward his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. And anyone who does the will of the most high is on the same level of Mary. Okay, I just wanted to uh, go on this term right quick because I know it mentioned uh, in what we read earlier how uh, images of Mary uh, were kind of, uh, you know, mixed with images of uh, paganism. And, and this is a term for it. It's called the Black Madonna. The term Black Madonna or Black Virgin tends to refer to statues or paintings in Western Christendom of the blessed Virgin Mary and the infant uh, Jesus, where both figures are depicted as black. The black Madonna can be found both in Catholic and Orthodox countries. And of course, the reason why both those figures are depicted as black is because Mary and Christ were both a black people and the people 
in the in the um, in ancient uh, Europe, meaning what <laughs> the twelve hundreds, eleven hundreds, fifteen hundreds, sixteen hundreds, all the way up to the late seventeen hundreds, were people of color, and they depicted their images in the Middle Ages. And essentially all the way up to uh, the time of the re Renaissance as people of color. But continuing on, the paintings are usually icons which are Byzantine in origin or style. Some made in the 13th or 14th century Italy. Others are older and from the Middle East, Caucasus or Africa, mainly Egypt and Ethiopia. And again, the Byzantine Empire, for you brothers who don't know, was ruled by a quote unquote black man. Statues are often made of wood, but occasionally made of stone painted and up to 75 centimeters tall, they fall in two main groups, three standing upright figures or seated figures on a throne. There are about 400 to 500 black Madonnas in Europe, depending on how they are classified. There are at least 180 Vergas Nordis in uh, Southern France alone. And there are hundreds of non medieval copies as well. Some are in museums, but most are in churches or shrines and are venerated by believers. Some are associated with miracles and abstract and attract substantial numbers of pilgrims. And again, this is what the scriptures mean about idolatry. You're worshiping an image as opposed to the true creator. Tuning it on. Black Madonnas come in different forms and speculations behind the reason of, for their dark hue of each individual icon or statue vary greatly and are not without controversy. Oh yeah, it's contra keeping up a lie is always controversial. <laughs> but continuing on. Though some Madonnas were originally black or brown when they were made, others have simply turned darker due to factors like aging or candle smoke well that's just that's just bullshit if, if some of them were originally uh, black or brown when they were made then that just lets you the vast majority of them are black or, or, or black and brown but continuing on the jugian scholar uh ian Begg has conducted a study in the potential pagan origins of the cult of the black madonna and child another speculated cause for the dark skin depiction is due to the pre-christian deities being re-envisioned as the madonna and child and that is true because for those of you who don't know, the pre-Christian uh, deities, all those deities in the ancient world were quote unquote people of color. But not even just the pre-Christian deities, the post-Christian deities in the Catholic Church were also painted black as well. It wasn't until um, the time of Pope Alexander VI uh, where he was commissioned, or he commissioned, I believe, um, how am I forgetting the brother's name? Uh but th those of you who know, who know what I'm talking about, like he basically connect, commissioned people to uh, depict, to, um, you know, to make depictions of the most high Christ and of the uh, angels and of, the, you know, the people of the script scriptures as a uh, quote unquote Caucasians. And it was Michael Michelangelo, I believe. But uh, y'all brothers can look it up. I believe it's Michelangelo, but it's, it's been a while since I looked up that information. Okay, yeah, now I just want to go back to the scriptures. This is Acts, the second chapter, verse 22. Now, this is the uh, apostle Peter speaking about um, Christ's role and um, also the prophecies of David as well. But let's read. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Yahweh Shai of Nazareth, a man approved of the Most High among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which the Most High did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of the Most High, he have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom the most high have raised up having loosened the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it and again it was not possible that he could be held by death because according to scriptures you know sin is what causes death because christ had never sinned death basically um he couldn't stay dead because again sin is what brings death but those who keep the law have eternal life but continue on for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall race in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And again, the apostle Peter is just letting us know that David, he is prophesying of a Christ's uh, resurrection uh, in the Psalms that he's quoting. Continue on, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that the Most High had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, 
he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne again. <laughs> For you brothers who, do, who, who don't know, this is letting you know that the Most High promised David that Christ would come from the fruit of his loins according to the fresh flesh. Now let's look up what this means for you brothers who are still confused what this means. Okay, so this is the word uh, loins. It means office. Let's look up what it means. The hip, loin, to gird, gird about the loins, a loin, the two loins. This is the, one, the, the main one, the place where the Hebrews thought the generative power, semen, resided. So again, when it's talking about the fruit of his loins, it's literally saying that Christ was going to come from the semen or the seed of David. He had a father. Now, according to the flesh. I'm pretty sure this word flesh should be a self-explanatory, but let's go anywhere. Sarks. Flesh, the soft or substance of the living body, which covers the bones and is permeated with blood of both man and beast. The body, the body of a man, be used of natural or physical origin, generation or relationship, born of natural generation. <laughs> so again, it's letting you know that Christ came from the sperm of David. He was born naturally. That's what it means when it's saying from the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh. Christ had a father and that father was Joseph. Okay. Now, um, right here, this is our first Chronicles 17 and seven. Like I read earlier in uh, Acts, the second chapter, how the most high had made a promise to David that of the fruit of his loins, Christ would come. And this is his promise right here. Now, therefore, thus shalt thou say unto my servant, David, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep cot, even from following the sheep that thou shouldest be ruler over my people, Israel. And I have been with thee, whithersoever thou hast walked, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and I have made thee a name like the name of the great men that are in the earth. Also, I will ordain a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, and they shall dwell in their place, and shall be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them any more, as at the beginning. And since the time that I command judges to be over my people Israel, moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. Furthermore, I tell thee that the Lord will build thee a house. And it shall come to pass when thy days be expired, that thou must go to be with thy fathers, that I will raise up a seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons. I will establish his kingdom. Now, again, a lot of brothers will read this and be like, well, isn't this uh, in reference to Solomon? It is, but it's in reference to Solomon, Rehoboam, Josiah, Hezekiah, all of those brothers. Because in the scriptures, when it mentions your sons, it's talking about every male descendant after you. So Christ is included as well because he comes from the seed line of David, like it shows us in Matthew, the first chapter. But continue on. He shall build me a house and I'll establish his throne forever. I'll be his father and he shall be my son. I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. But I will sell him my house and my king and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forevermore. According to all these words and according to all this vision. So did Nathan speak unto, the, unto David. And again, specifically verse 14 about the throne or the kingdom being established forever. We know that can't be in reference to any of the kings of old because all they all died. Their rulership ended. This kingdom being established forevermore is a reference to Christ. Because again, Christ is the man who is considered the son of the most high and whose kingdom is going to last forever. Now, uh, this is uh, Psalms, the uh, second chapter. Uh, this is a, prof um, a prophetic uh, writing right here going into in Christ's rulership. But Psalms 2 and 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the other most parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And again, when Christ returns during his second coming, that's what's going to happen. He's going to destroy the nations and rule over them with a rod of iron. And those of us who are of the nation of Israel, because we're joint heirs with Christ, we're also going to be ruling the nations with a rod of iron and dashing them in the pieces. But continuing on, be wise now thereof, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. 
again, blessed are all they that put their trust in him, meaning those of us who have faith in the son, who believe in the son and understand that through his sacrifice, we have a, a chance to repent and come unto the father. And, you know, we have to keep the laws and the statutes the best of our ability. We are going to be received that great blessing during his return. But yeah, this is another a precept I want to touch to on the fact that a Christ, again, had to be born like every other person. He, he had to have a, a the, the seed, basically take on the seed of Abraham to uh, fulfill the prophecy. But continuing on, Hebrews 2 and 9. But we see Yahweh Shai, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of the Most High, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom all, are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Meaning what? That verse 10. Not only, like we read in the Psalms, the uh, second chapter, is Christ going to receive everything. He was also involved in creating everything as well. He was uh, one of the forces, as, as long with the angels of the Most High, that were deputized by the Most High to create the, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, and everything in it. But uh, that's another concept that I want to touch on on another day. Uh, continuing on, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto thy, my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee? And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, the children which the Most High hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil. Meaning, just like all of us are born, uh, you know, we're fleshly, we, we, we came through mothers and fathers, you know, man has sex with a woman, the seed goes into the woman, a child is born through flesh and blood, Christ also came to that same way. Continue on. Verse 15, and delivered them and delivered them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Meaning what? He didn't come on the earth as some angelic uh, mystical being. He came on the earth as a human being like everybody else. He took on that seed of Abraham through uh, Joseph. Continue on though. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. I'll repeat that one more time. Wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest and things pertaining to the Most High, to make reconciliations for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Meaning what? He had to be fully made a human being and go through the human experience, you know, day to day living so that he can become a proper mediator between Christ and men. Because even though the, the Most High understands all things, he's not, not fleshly and a weak like uh, we human beings were. But Christ at one point did have the weakness of the flesh, but he was able to overcome it. And again, for him to have that weakness of the flesh, he had to come from the seed of a man. Because again, it was Adam who sinned, so it was men who sinned. So for Christ to have that fleshly uh, sin nature, he had to come through the seed of a man, not saying that Christ did sin, but he had that fleshly sin nature like the rest of us. The difference between us and Christ is he had that Holy Spirit of wisdom on him to be able to overcome his fleshly nature. So when he was tempted, he didn't succumb to that temptation. That's the difference between us and Christ. OK, and this is a prophecy dealing with uh, Christ. Again, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Jesse was the father of David. So again, there's gonna, there's letting you know there's going to be a person who comes from that seed line or lineage. But let's look up the, the word. Okay, yeah, let's look up this word of branch. The word branch is Nasir. Now sprout, shoot, branch. Always figurative. So what does it figuratively mean? Let's go down. A sprout, a shoot, so called from being verdant. See root number two, Isaiah 60, 21. Metaphor used of offspring so again there's letting you know there's going to be an offspring of jesse who is of course jesse is the father of david so it's an offspring of david but well, let's go back so isaiah 11 verse 2 and the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the lord so again 
for those of you brothers who read Luke, the first chapter, or even Matthew, the first chapter, when it says that Mary had con conceived child with the Holy Ghost, is letting you know, because the Holy Ghost is the Spirit of the Lord, that that child had the Spirit of the Lord on him, meaning he had these qualities. He had wisdom. He had understanding. He had knowledge. He had a natural fear of the Most High from within the womb, not saying that <laughs> Mary was impregnated <laughs> by the Spirit. That, that shit is silly. But continue on, verse 3, and shall make a him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lip shall he slay the wicked. Meaning he was going to slay and convict the wicked with his words because words are powerful, man, especially the truth. When people hear the truth, <laughs> they get very enraged. OK, yeah, this right here is just an example of Christ having the quote unquote spirit of the Lord on him being wisdom, knowledge and understanding. Luke, the second chapter. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days and they returned, the child Yahushai tarried behind in Jerusalem and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Now, again, the reason why um, his parents went to Jerusalem every year is uh, to fulfill a um, requirement of the law. Because according to the law of Moses, every year or excuse me, three times a year. Uh, the, the men of the Lord had to present themselves before the Most High. And it was during the Passover, I believe the Pentecost and the um, Feast of Tabernacles. I believe those are the three times where men had to present themselves before the Most High. Continuing on, though, but they supposing him to have been in the company went a day's journey and they sought him among their kings and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And they came to pass that after three days, they found them in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. Again, the reason why he had the, the understanding of his answers is because he had the Holy Spirit on him from, from in his womb. So he understood many things intuitively. Continuing on. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son, why hast thou thus thou, excuse me, son, why hast thou Thus dealt with us. Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. <laughs> now, again, wait a minute. According to the scriptures, if, if quote unquote, Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit and Joseph wasn't the father, why were they confused about what Christ was saying? If he was talking about his father's business, it would have been clear to them that he was, they were talking about the Most High. The fact that they're confused, that's another way of showing you that they didn't know the, the quote unquote concept of Christ being a born a quote unquote without a father. It is it, it, not it's not truly biblical. But anyway, I'll pick this up in part three.